Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you. I got to get my bell, who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. I got to ring the purple bell because this is the 700th episode of Chef AJ Live, and I have terrific guests to celebrate this momentum momentous occasion, none other than Dr. Jen Hawk and Dr. Doug Lyle. Welcome them to the show. It's great to see you guys again. Cool, AJ. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. 700. <laughs> You're in the 700 club. What's so great is uh, for, for people that are in your group like me, we already got to hear you guys talk today. So that's something you guys might want to consider. And I will put that in the show notes. Before I get to the questions, if you guys wouldn't mind, this is True North Health Week and you were scheduled. But as it turned out, this is perfect because even though you might not be working there right now, you both were a big part of the success of True North. And one of the things Dr. Goldhammer is promoting is the fact that many of his doctors do health coaching or uh, consultations via, via phone phone or zoom but you guys always did that and i want people to know that and i'm curious with your experience at true north like what what was the patient kind of patients that would be great candidates to have phone consultations with you people that were at, at the true north health center or even people that are just watching and don't know that you guys do this huh. um i i think I, I don't think that there's a i think it's anybody that's got a um that is struggling with any kind of challenge and that they are, they're, they're, they, you know, they've gone, gone it alone with the information that they have and they're stuck and they just can't get, get out of a self-defeating pattern. So that's, yeah, but, but Jen and I are, you know, we do that, that kind of consulting. We also do consulting uh, the, the certainly on all broad issues in, in your life. In other words, the health challenges are a, are simply a special case of a wider uh, a wider issue, which is how do you go about organizing your life and the choices that you make in all, all domains of your life. So uh, we're both generalists in that way, but we certainly uh, know a lot about the problems in and around the pleasure trap. Uh, we've certainly talked to an awful lot of people and have, have worked that over from all angles. So. You know, that that's you know any, anybody that's struggling uh, which is common just because the, the the problem is is that knowing what to do and then executing on it are two different things and sometimes there are fine details that are worthwhile so yeah you can come to our website at steam dynamics and and that's where you can find us the uh, and you can also find uh, we also have we have a little thing called the healthy helpers corner uh, with uh, Nathan Gersfeld who does consulting uh, can consult with people about doing uh, water only fasts uh, virtually uh, doesn't mean you do it virtually it means you do you do it in reality at your home but Nathan can check in with you and then also Justina Fries who also is a, a person that we refer to for people that are struggling with e eating problems so we all do very similar things there but I think Jen, Jen and I are certainly uh, uh, are certainly available for food related, that's that kind of stuff. But we're also available for everything else, just general life problem solving in, in kids, romance, relationships, friendships, in-laws, you know, uh, the ego trap with respect to career. Doesn't matter what the domain is, uh, we, are, we are there to try to help people uh, make their lives better by sometimes shifting their perspective and, and helping them uh, move forward. Yeah, I would say that we we really think of ourselves more as problem solver. We're, we're, we're like mechanics for a car. We're trying to locate the the actual problem and fix it. We're not trying to create a client for life. We're not trying to get you to come back and dig deeper into your childhood to figure out what's going on. We're trying to figure out why you're hitting a wall, why you're stuck, what's going on. Um, so yeah, if you if you've been repeating things to yourself like I'm stuck or the the number one thing that I hear from people, which is I know what to do. Why can't I just do it? Like why am I stopping myself? What's wrong? with me. Um, those are the kind of things that are a cue that it would be really helpful to, to potentially talk to one of us or these other people that Doug is mentioning. Um, and yeah, we, we definitely deal with everything in the life experience from, from health to relationships to work to everything else. So great. Thank you. And I'm guessing a lot of, I'm guessing it's causing me a lot of trouble. I'm guessing oh, a lot of teenager. Oh, the teenager. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, AJ, what? Oh, no, I was just saying, I'm guessing that a lot of people that met you at True North probably are still clients today. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we talked to talked to lots of folks who have been in and out of True North, um, either when one one or both of us was there or before we were there. There's a lot of overlap. So great. Well, yeah. thanks. And I want to thank for the super chat donation and get to the first question from Jesse, which I've often wondered myself. Why is it that people seem to have no problem making critical comments about our health and weight when we have lost weight, but rarely comment on our poor health condition when we're fat? <laughs> Yeah. Um, interesting. Uh, I, I, I'd, uh, I'd actually want to see evidence on that before, you know, pontificating uh, about that. But I think it's, I think people, if they see a change that, that uh, looks like you could be thinking that it's in a positive direction, then, then it's not, it's not uh, essentially bad manners. Uh, in principle, to comment in that direction, uh, it would be bad manners to comment in any other direction. So, uh, but you know, I, I saw my father rudely inform women that it looks like that they had gained weight. <laughs> oh, God. That's my both my grandparents, my my <laughs> grandfathers were famous for that. I think that's a generational thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think yeah. you see that as much anymore. I, no. I, I, I think the, the world has gotten a little more sensitive about that, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it, I think it has to do with the inference of, of whether or not we are. Uh, <clears throat> whether we'd like to hear it or not. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. There's also probably a component of, um, you know, when something doesn't make sense, look for the status. That's one of our kind of guiding principles of life. And, and I do think there is a uh, particularly between women kind of a little competitive dynamic that can emerge where uh, women are very unlikely to comment on somebody gaining weight or being unhealthfully large. But if they start getting more competitive, they start losing weight, it starts looking like they're, they're having success that may or may not be attainable for, for that other person. They might say something in a, in a competitive strike that could be part of the dynamic. I think that often happens um, emergent from the personalities that are involved. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think uh, there is some, that's, that's not a hugely widespread phenomenon. There's a little bit of selection bias because people tend to be very sensitive when that does happen, that they perceive it happening more often than it actually is happening out there in the world. So right. people who are sort of disagreeable and blunt are likely to be disagreeable and blunt about a lot of things. <laughs> um, and uh, it, we're just, we're only going to notice it when we feel offended. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember once Dr. McDougall told me I looked like I had gained weight and I was still pretty thin. So yeah. <laughs> again, yeah. that's the, that's the grandfather right. factor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, It yeah, reminds that's... me a lot of my, my, my very disagreeable grandfather who just would just very matter of fact, like yeah. point that out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and now another super chat donation from Diane. Thank you. And there's a comment from Beth that Dr. Lyle, you're looking very handsome today. Oh, well, he got himself a, a haircut. Yeah, very nice. And and people, as always, they love your laugh. Here's an, a, a great question. And I don't think I've listened to every episode of Beat Your Jeans at, at least once. And I don't think you covered it or if you did, I don't remember. But Candace says, uh, dear doctors, I'm a big fan of the Beat Your Jeans podcast. And I don't know if you've ever answered this, but I'm very curious from an evolutionary standpoint, why female orgasm exists. In order to ejaculate, a man has to have an orgasm, but a woman can still ovulate and conceive without one. So what is the purpose of female orgasm? Well, Jen can answer or I can answer. There's, there's... We, have, we have talked about this. It has come yeah. up before. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of, of purposes, um, but the main one is, you know, it may or may not aid in the pregnancy process. The, the sort of, you know, actual uh, fertilization may be more likely if you have an orgasm. I think the more important relevant reason that we evolved this feature is that it's, it's a signal that you're in the right place. I mean, you're, you're sort of, you're, you're with the right of all of your choices of all of those uh, male apes wandering around bidding for your attention. This one is the best of all. Um, and so, you know, most women are, uh, th this is, this is not a purely physical process for most women. It's an emotional, it's a, there's a lot going on with, um, a, a woman's ability to reach that point in a sexual relationship. So it's, it's really just nature's way of telling you, you've made a pretty good choice about where, where you're spending your evening, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, Doug can add 
to yeah. anything that he might have to, to add to that. Things are, um, mm -hmm. uh, I think, I think uh, an, an additional sort of overall way of looking at this would be that orgasm would be an incentive to have sex mm -hmm. in principle. Okay, so that that's a, the 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 larger, wider context. And, uh, and then in addition to that, what we call a Mr. Right detector. Uh, so that's a, <laughs> that's a, uh, again, imperfect because you could have a, a, a great relationship but the, the technical aspects of the, of the, the sexual action between those two people doesn't wind up mechanically hitting an orgasm for the female, but it doesn't, it wouldn't matter. All it would have to be would be something that that you are 1% more likely to have an orgasm with Mr. Right than Mr. Wrong. If it was just a tiny little effect size, then that would be enough to get uh, selected by evolution. And I'm sure that it's more than that. Okay, so in fact, we know that it's more than that. And yeah, the contractions that go on in orgasm actually result in a retention of seminal fluid uh, significantly. So all, all three of those things, I think, stir the pot and make that uh, part of human uh, natural uh, female psychology. Wow, that's really interesting. Well, a place where they force females to have circumcision, that that's not good then for this process. Not Maybe good for they, a lot of processes. Right, of course. Yeah. I mean, I know it's yeah. barbaric, but if it's yeah. true that an orgasm helps facilitate, you know, pregnancy, that would be a reason also not to do it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, that's just a, yeah. yeah, barbaric beyond belief. Absolutely. Totally. Yeah. Okay, so on to happier things, rats. <laughs> I, I, if, if you substitute spiders for this, I can relate. Sharon's question. Pretty bad when rats are happier than orgasms. I just have to point out. <laughs> I meant We're on the wrong path in life. <laughs> no, I meant happier than circumcision. <laughs> Not right. I know. That's funny. So can you help me with a fear? Many years ago, I was sitting at a public event and a rat ran across my feet. It touched me when I had on sandals. Since then, I've developed a fear of rodent, rodents. I can't even look at a picture of them. Any suggestions to help me overcome my fear? Um, well, there, there, there could be things that you could do. So for example, you could get yourself a pet rat, okay? If you got yourself a pet rat, then you would, uh, and then you are very secure with this pet rat, then you also might find that you could take it up and hold it and then it's little feet and the way it's little feet feel on your, your skin won't be as freaky. Okay, so this is just a uh, systematic desensitization. Uh, if you wanted to start and you and a rat was too, too right. grisly and weird. Start with a hamster. hamster. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that would be a, a reasonable way to try to combat that. Yeah. Yeah. That was the first thing that occurred to me too. This is, this is just the nervous system kind of running correlations on, on how likely this is to happen again and how scary it is likely to be if it happens again. So I've told this story several times where I was, I was bitten by a centipede when we were um, living in, uh, in Hawaii, which was terrible, super, super painful. And I had some window of time where I avoided the location of the crime. It was, it was a particular couch and it was hiding in the cushions of the couch. And I was very paranoid about going over there and, and relaxing too much on that couch because it could be in there, it could bite me again. And that eventually wanes with enough time. It never totally goes away. Um, um, but there's, you just keep adding data to the little equation that's running in your head of how many times have I sat on this couch and been bitten versus how many times have I sat here and not been bitten under exactly the same circumstances. So you're, you're, you're putting new information into that little risk assessment and, and doing something to kind of hack that system by uh, introducing the thing that you're afraid of and, and exposing yourself to it in a systematic way by, by with a hamster or with a rat, um, I think would be, would be very, very helpful. Um, and should work most of the time, unless it was like a long standing pre-existing terror of this, of this thing, then we might have to go a few notches back, get smaller, uh, smaller creatures with different types of feet to, to run across your feet. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So this is from Julie. She says, uh, I heard Dr. Lyle say that people want to recreate humans who look like them. I'm adopted. And I wonder how parents adapt to that scenario. 
Well, slow, uh, they, they, want, they don't want to recreate humans to look like them. They are, they're designed by nature to be, to be looking for cues that the little creatures that, they, that, that are ostensibly their children do look like them, okay? And that they like those looks, by the way. So in other words, people, when, when we take uh, digital photography and morph faces into uh, in, into another face. Like if I were to take, uh, for example, uh, my face and, and morph it into AJ's face. So you might say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, it would still, you'd still look at the picture and it would look like AJ, but it would, we could take like 10% of some of my features and put them in there. And it would, you would say, oh, it's just AJ kind of on a different day, looking slightly different. You know, maybe she's been, you know, out on a boat and, and things are a, a, a little, you know, windswept or something. But what would ultimately happen is if I were to look at that photograph, I would like it a little better, okay? This is a strange truth, okay? So, and yet if you, if you were to take my next door neighbor and morph it into AJ's face, I wouldn't like it better, okay? So, so, there, so we do have machinery for that. And of course, uh, the, the reasons for that pro almost certainly have to do with human beings uh, forming in-group feelings towards a tribe where they've got little pieces of their genetic code around the tribe. So this would, this would follow the, the rules of altruistic behavior where I should be uh, more willing to self-sacrifice for people who are my genetic code as opposed to not. So that's how it is that that works. We have a preference for genes that that look like us. Now we're going to go back to the question since I lost it. So go ahead and say the question again. Oh, adoption. Um, so what's 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 up with adoption? Let me go back to it. I was already going. Yeah. I'll find it again. Okay, it's here. Oh, come on. I think basically just how how do parents adapt to that, or how do they come to terms okay, with that? I'll find it. I'll find it. I skipped a. I, one more. Okay, here it is. Uh, doc, I heard Dr. Lyle say that people want to recreate humans who look like them. I'm adopted and wonder how parents adapt to the scenario. Cause a lot of times people adopt people, uh, children of other races and things like that. How do they adapt to that scenario? Well, the truth of the matter is, is that, um, that we, we know that, uh, in other words, that the, the attachment that people would feel towards an adopted child is, is rarely going to equal what they would feel towards biological child. Now, that doesn't mean that they can't, you know, love and adopt a child very much, uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna typically find that, that it's going to be less than uh, it would have been had there been a biological, had the child been biological. That's just normal. That's just in the, in the DNA of the species and probably not just our species, but all species. Well, other species aren't doing much adopting. Okay, so, right. the, uh, so there's no, this applies to stepkids too, by the way, stepkids right. and sort of good. mixed families. And so a lot of the conflict that, you know, emerges in mixed families, there, there, it, there are some differentials and, and preferences that a lot of people are really uncomfortable talking about. You just feel uh, a different type of connection a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. But this is, uh, this, this is one of the chief architects of, of major conflict in blended families. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, you know, if I've got a son and she's got a daughter, uh, I am totally favoring my son over her daughter and she's favoring her daughter over my son. And everybody feels like they're playing fair, but they aren't uh, because everybody's got their thumb on the genetic scale. So mm -hmm. that's how that goes. And so uh, again, adoption is an amazing, uh, amazing characteristic that human beings uh, desired the process of parenting so much that they are, you know, that they would like to do that process, uh, even though it's not their DNA. And so the, uh, I understand that since I sort of half asked halfway raised for <laughs> stepchildren, the, um, but, the, uh, so I understand the, the, the value of those processes. It, uh, many of those parenting processes that I did during that, uh, those times felt really valuable and productive. Uh, felt very heroic and therefore worthy of, of the woman's admiration for me. <laughs> it's still <laughs> heroic when they drive you out of your own refrigerator. <laughs> when, they, 
when they're 25 and won't leave the house. Yeah, that's a whole different story. Then, then, then it's then it's warfare, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So in other words, there's nothing. Uh, all that one can feel as an adopted child is is that you 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 hope hope that to, to feel loved and that you're very important. Uh, you may feel that um, that it wasn't. You know, it, it wasn't as as strong as you've sometimes observed in other people. Uh, and however, sometimes it's probably better that some other people have had it. So, the, sure. uh, yeah, but there are parents coming to terms with that. They, there is no terms to that. In other words, they're they're just they've got this child uh, and they are attached to it, and they they have empathy circuits that like they like they want to watch it grow and thrive. And they're trying to aid and abet that. And they've got mirror neurons that share in your joys and that that they share in your sorrows. Um, But they're not feeling it probably at the level of intensity that they would feel if it was their genes. That's all. It's kind of like, it may be nice music, but it may not be out on quite as loud as you'd like it. And in other words, it's just not quite the intensity. And that's probably what the life experience is. Thank you. So this question from Laura, we get a lot in various forms. You might've touched on it in our private group. I'm not sure you talked about it on YouTube, but it's about volume eating and eating past full. And she says, I've always been obese because I ate too much through a lonely childhood. My menu used to include processed and SOS foods with lots of animal products. For the last two years, I've been whole food plant-based, but I still feel compelled to eat past satisfied. I overeat, even though it's mostly veggie, soup, salads, rice, potatoes, and fruit with occasional AJ type recipe. Identify, I identify with the term volume eater as only massive amounts of food comforts me and turns off the compulsion to eat. I eat until I feel sick. I have high blood pressure medications, had cancer twice. I'm a type two diabetic on insulin and have atrial fibrillation. I'm also a very successful retired teacher, professor, and grandmother, age 73, who was 130 pounds overweight for decades, but is now stuck at 90 pounds overweight. I feel like I'm stuck in the pleasure trap. Yes, I've read it, lovely, and on the cramp circuit, even though I'm without the SOS foods. I've been stable for the last two years, whole food plant-based. Any advice is welcome. Talk to Justina. Okay, so this yeah, is Justina a, is the go-to for this. this yeah. This is not a... Uh, this is not a sort of one-off thing that we can give you something quick in two minutes. Uh, you you're probably want to process this with, uh, with somebody that, uh, and develop some plans, develop some little experiments that you run. Uh, you're going to want to try to triangulate and feel your way to a, a set of choices that may be more successful for you. So uh, go, to, go to our website, esteemdynamics.com, look, look for the Healthy Helpers, and you'll see Justina Fries, and uh, you'll go to her website. And then communicate with her. Uh, that's that's where you want to go for battling this type of thing. Okay, you know, I, I sometimes hear this question though for people that aren't struggling with weight, and they they complain that they always eat past full. Mm-hmm. But if if your weight's okay, why? I mean, why is that a problem? That's what I don't understand. Yeah, I hear that all the time. People sort of uh, putting putting this on themselves as some kind of judgment that, oh, I'm eating too much or I'm binge eating, but it's not actually having consequences really. Um, and so this is this always goes back to uh, just kind of the, a, a lot of this is this kind of short-term cycle where you're, uh, you're, you're behaving badly. And then you sort of feel like in the, in the language of 12 step, I know this is a family program, so I'll try to modulate my language, but you get a case of the efforts, you know, just screw it. I'm, I'm just going to forget the whole thing. I'm just going to go all in on doing whatever I want. So very, it's very rare to, uh, have a consistent period of time, but let, let's say 60 days where you're, you're volume eating, um, or you're, or you're binging on healthy foods. Um, and you're not using that as a pretext to go go off plan and, and do other things that, that maybe are more detrimental to your health. If you're, if you're, if th- that's really all you're doing for the 60 days, you're not going to see, um, you're, you're going to be losing weight probably, even though you're binging on healthy foods. And so it's, it's this process that people don't give themselves enough time and consistency, even with the behaviors within that, that they feel are, um, out of bounds or problematic when really that's, it's just kind of the, the hunger drive calibrating to a new diet. Most of the time. That's, that's most often what I see. Um, or it's people carrying, uh, the assumptions of what binge eating looks like from a, from a more calorie dense diet. 
um, or, uh, you know, all of these kinds of, you, you know, you, you, you're you used to these weighing and measuring programs. And so you're only supposed to eat a certain number of calories or a certain uh, volume of food. And so you have these feelings that you're just, you're being bad and you're doing the wrong thing. Uh, you really need to give your nervous system time to observe over 30 to 60 to 90 days that it's not having these adverse consequences that you're anticipating. Yeah. And I think I agree with what you say. It's that they came from a history of some kind of restriction. So maybe yeah. they've never felt full before until right. they, yeah. right. Right. And so suddenly they feel bloated or super full. And it's like, that's, that's actually, you just have a belly full of potatoes and that's what it feels like. And so you have to kind of re readjust and recalibrate to the, the new normal there. Right. Some people are saying, but it feels uncomfortable to be too full. So, well, I'll tell you what, uh, and I have done this with people. There's no reason in the world that you can't eat four or five times a day. Not at all. Right. Okay. Right. So you, you don't have to put all that pressure with a low calorie dense diet on say three meals. Don't do it. So, you know, if you're, if you're going to, if you're eating, you know, a pound and a half of food three times a day and a pound and a half is too much, then, then eat, you know, a pound of food four and a half times. Uh, I mean, eat a, that, that's how, that's how I would go about doing that. And sometimes that is uh, very effective. We take pressure off by essentially incorporating one one additional meal time, uh, so that we we are not you know priming our way to guilt. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there who are um, have put themselves in really uh, strict intermittent fasting programs, right. or um, you know they have a really narrow little window, or they're trying to do one meal a day, or they're trying all of all of these kinds of things that uh, are seeking a different goal than finding this just stable equilibrium with with your diet. So those two things often can't coexist at the same time. I once asked Dr. Goldhammer if he ever overate, and he said at every meal. <laughs> I mean, literally, and, and I, you know, I only eat two meals a day, not because I'm intermittent fasting, because I never ate breakfast. And each of my meals is three pounds. And I'm like, I don't get what you're talking about. This is great. Yeah, people need to go to True North, True North and see the, the multiple plates that, that Goldhammer comes out with loaded, fully loaded. Um, his son, who is who is tiny, totally out eats him, you know, multiple wow. giant plates of food at every meal time. So um, there is there's sort of an adjustment recalibration process. Great. Thank you. And I want to thank Susanna for the super chat donation. And I saw one more. Hold on. It's going very fast. I don't want to forget anybody. And Annette, thank you so much. Okay. The next question is from Morgan. I've heard about Dr. Lyle's behavioral equilibrium, and I've been at a plateau for over two years. I still have health concerns that I believe could be alleviated by losing more weight. I'm 44 and currently weigh about 160 pounds at five foot six. I feel guilty for wanting more results. My husband and friends see how far I've come and to them it's enough. My husband says I look amazing. Heck yeah, I do. But he doesn't understand my remaining health concern and is scared I'm trying to become a toothpick. I'm not. I'm a hyper conscientious, highly agreeable, highly open low emotional stability introvert that prefers to be a caretaker over taking the spotlight. How can I push through? Well, I'm not sure what it is that she's eating that, that has her at five, six, one sixty. Uh, but, and it also sounds like she's come a long ways. We don't know where she came from. So if she came from 225 and now she's 160, we may be hitting a genetic limit uh, with a two-year equilibrium if she's doing a really good job on her diet. And that may be what the genes have to say to her uh, in, in terms of what is a, a very healthy situation for her. So it, um, Alan has a way of looking at, at things that is slightly upside down and backwards from the way most people would look at. And that is that he would say, don't worry about your cholesterol level, for God's sakes. Just worry about what you're eating. What are you eating? If you're eating a really good food, then I'm not going to be worried about your cardiovascular quote disease. The, uh, so I'm not going to be chasing numbers around. So in that same way, I'm not sure what her health concerns are, but uh, if she's eating a very healthy diet uh, and has obviously made a tremendous amount of improvement, if she's made substantial improvement over, uh, and now it is sort of stopped here, I'm not, I'm not sure what I would be worried about health-wise unless we had objective evidence that there would be something to be worried about. And in terms of the weight also, I would have the same kind of an attitude uh, about this 
there are people that are five foot six and 160 pounds and who, who are in very, very good condition. And based on what their genes are, they are at an equilibrium. Okay, so uh, could they be a thinner equilibrium? Sure, they, we, we could move them more towards some rabbit food and we don't know exactly where, where it would ultimately land. But the, some of this variation is natural. So again, the question, uh, not, not that I'm cross-examining, question for the person to be looking at is, am I actually doing a really good job at the food that I eat? Uh, if you are, then we're not, there is no breaking through uh, to some other side. There's no mythical process by which suddenly we're gonna become 145 pounds eating the very same foods that we're eating now. Okay, so that's not going to take place. So the question is, do we have the food right? And if we have the food right, you know, this is kind of one of those things where we live with the results. Unless there's some bizarre reason why we might suspect there's something out of whack, like a thyroid uh, would be the only thing that I would check. But hmm, I don't know, that's my meanderings. Jen, what cross yeah. your mind? Yeah, no, exactly that. I think people, especially when they're coming from a, a much higher weight, they've come a long way. I mean, your your genes are talking through you, saying that you've you've got a, just kind of a higher equilibrium. You're you're just gonna it's going if you are eating a very healthy whole food plant based diet, you're gonna be floating around at the higher end of your healthy BMI. Um, and there's this range depending on how how tight you tighten those screws and how low you bring that calorie density. But there's no point in bringing the calorie density to a point that's not sustainable for you long term unless you're trying to drop a few pounds for a high school reunion or something, because you're not going to stay there. Um, if you are, if you're eating a diet that is uh, sustainable and satisfying for you and, and you've, you've had this stable weight and it's a whole food plant-based diet, that's your genes telling you that that's where you're hanging out given this diet. So of course you can adjust it. Of course you can bring the calorie density down and, and move toward rabbit food as Doug is saying. Um, but it's going to be very, very, very difficult to stay there long-term unless you continue eating in that sort of unsustainable under the hunger drive sort of way. Um, and some people can do that. And some people, uh, because they, they have innate reward that comes from volume in a way that other people don't. So um, other people, you know, some people cannot eat a, a, a calorie dilute diet and, and get the sort of satisfaction from the volume that other people will. They need to, they need to notch it up a little bit. And that probably means they're going to have a little more weight on them um, as a stable equilibrium. So people exist in a range um, and that range fluctuated a lot during the stone age, depending on the availability of, of food and resources at any given time. So it's, it's hard we get attached to numbers, we get attached to sort of wanting to be in a certain place or feeling like we haven't gone far enough. But uh, we know that if you if you were stable at a really high weight on the standard American diet, that you you have genes that are uh, that easily put on and keep on weight. And, and so you are just hanging out there at that at that higher point in that spectrum. Great. Yeah. Well, one other little detail, which is that it was a part of the question, and it probably is not related, but it could be. And which is exercise. So, you know, the world thinks exercise is this big deal with respect to weight. Um, it's a small deal, but it's not a zero deal. And so, uh, the truth is, is that uh, typically people are under-exercised. Uh, and so, the, and often, if you increase the amount of exercise, which can be very modest with respect to calorie burning, you might you might burn 80 to 100 calories a day doing a little bit more exercise than you're doing. Uh, and which would be a fairly significant workout. Uh, however, it may very well be the case that you do not increase your caloric intake. Mm -hmm. That often can happen. And so now suddenly the person that was at 160, you know, we look at them 18 months later and they're at 150 uh, because we have changed something in the equilibrium. And what we changed was we added a moderate amount of exercise that they weren't doing. So that we'll add that to the equation. But when, when Jen's talking about genes and individual differences, I chuckled uh, a bunch of us, the whole bunch of people in this community that I, uh, I the, you know, there's a hundred guys out there that play basketball. And we're all, we're all like, you know, elbowing each other around, pushing each other around, calling fouls. And there's a whole bunch of guys that can play. And some are better than others, but it's all pretty similar. And then what walked in the gym about three weeks ago was a six foot seven inch African-American young man, about 24 years old, that apparently played at the University of Nevada at Reno. 
So he wasn't six foot seven and 190 skinny pounds. He was six foot seven and 225 pounds and he could jump and he could, it was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you playing here? Okay. They're like all of us that are struggling for a little status out there. It's like a joke. This guy is just completely different than the rest of us. So if you're, if you are doing a good job and you're five, six and 160 and you're exercising and you're in good shape, Hey, you're one of us. Okay. Fair enough. And, and when, when, uh, you know, when, I don't know, Angelina walks by, it's like, <laughs> that's just a whole different creature and we could just totally. forget it. <laughs> well, this poor basketball guy, you know, maybe he's been in the ego trap. He used to be a superstar and now he's just, it's the equivalent of going and auditioning for community theater. You know, he's got to get back out there. <laughs> yeah. That we was, don't know his story or, or maybe he's pretty, trying to be a big fish. Ridiculous, I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, we have one more question that was submitted in advance, which is the best way, especially when we have doctors and then we'll get to as many as we can in the chat. This is from Rich. Five years ago, you did an interview with Potato Strong called Nutrient Obsession, Stop It Now. If it's true that our bodies recycle nutrients, then why are so many vegans worried about getting their G-bombs and daily dozen? And now everyone is worried about their selenium and DHA and drinking mushroom coffee, green tea, and eating broccoli sprouts for sulfurophane <laughs> and afraid to eat rice and potatoes. Will the madness ever end? Um, probably not. Uh, this is the same madness that drove the entire natural foods industry. So uh, the natural foods industry would not exist uh, today if it were not actually the concern of nutrient deficiency. So nutrient deficiency is the number one concern of, of people in and around diet. Uh, nutrient excess is not really a concern. And nutrient poisoning is. So people are, are more worried about pesticide residue and nutrient deficiency than they are worried about macronutrient imbalance, particularly excess. That's never gonna change. You're, you're looking inside of human nature and seeing uh, that humans needed to be worried about two things in the stone age, being poisoned uh, by their food. And they also, uh, so they have innate mechanisms, both the smell, taste preference mechanisms, as well as unbelievably outstanding uh, conditioning uh, mechanisms that if you get sick after you eat something, you wind up with what's known as a conditioned aversion. Uh, this is true throughout the animal kingdom. Animals have this uh, characteristic and human beings have it. So we've got a lot of natural concerns about being poisoned by food. Uh, that's easy to translate the concept that if somebody sprayed some shit on it and it's all going to kill us and give us cancer. It's very easy for for people to be worried about that. It's also very easy for people to be worried about nutritional deficiency, i.e. if we don't get enough to eat, we're all gonna to starve to death. So those two problems of imbalance will always lead this show. Those will be the two stars of health-seeking behavior around diet. The third, uh, the also ran is, hey, we're eating too much shit, okay? That's always going to come in third. And so the truth is, is that that, belong, that belongs first, second, and third, and the other two things belong not even on the podium. Okay, so, but, but we, the reason why our instincts on this are so wrong is because the environment you find yourself in is dramatically different on these questions uh, than it was in the Stone Age for which your mental machinery evolved. So that is the story. The madness will never end. So when you listen to start people pontificating about uh, the, the grandiosity of nutrients or the terror of some kind of a poison, uh, keep it in perspective that those don't belong on the podium. Uh, they're not non-existent concerns. They are, uh, they are concerns that we have to have one little lazy eye that wanders over to the left every now and then and make sure we're paying attention. Uh, but those are the last thing that you need to be worried about. The first thing you need to be worried about is eating too much rich crap, okay? And once again, it's interesting. One thing, I, I, I don't know, I've probably not said this. I don't know that I've ever said this publicly, AJ. This now comes up as an issue in these questions, but I've told many people this uh, personally or that have come to me with questions. Um, and this, this goes to uh, Alan's issue of, 
pay attention to what you're eating. Don't be paying too much attention to uh, somebody's, you know, false god of a score. And that is that um, uh, I have very high cholesterol. So my cholesterol consistently runs over 225. Uh, I've never had a cholesterol under 225. Uh, my cholesterol typically runs around 250. So there, there's probably some people gasping out there. It's like, well, I'm not gasping. Uh, the cholesterol is just a, a measurement that correlates on a population level with cardiovascular disease. So if we take a million people uh, over here, this cholesterol level is 225, and we take another million people whose cholesterol level is 175, we're going to find that the people that have 225, that population of a million people is going to have a hell of a lot of heart disease in it. And the population with 175 will have very little heart disease in it. Why? Okay. It's not because the cholesterol is damaging. It's because the cholesterol is a marker for how much animal food you eat. It's the percentage of animal food in the diet. It is not the cholesterol level per se. Cholesterol level per se is a naturally flu fluctuating variable in human beings by virtue of genetics. I happen to run high cholesterol. It is endogenous. It's not coming from the animal food that I eat. So therefore my cholesterol level is not a, now if my cholesterol level went up 50 points after I had introduced a bunch of animal food, then we would know that I was getting myself into trouble, okay? But my cholesterol level is what it is naturally. This is just a, totally akin to the person who, if they're eating healthily and they're five, six, and 160 pounds, if they're eating healthy food, they're healthy. Okay, that's, I mean, that's how that works. This is naturally varying genetics. So um, anyway, uh, the, but the point is, is that people then would get worried about such a thing. And if I was to talk to a hundred cardiologists that were not really sharp and, and aware of the causal connection between animal protein and vascular disease, those, those hundred cardiologists uh, around Sacramento would all tell me, oh boy, you better go on statins. I'd be like, you're a moron. You, have, you, you did not ask the critical question. How the hell did you get the high cholesterol? You didn't actually check uh, another measure of whether or not I've got a pathological condition, which would be high sensitivity C reactive protein. If you check my high sensitivity C reactive protein, which is an actual measurement of a pathological condition, you'll find that it's basically zero. Okay. It's better than somebody who is eating 10% of their intake from animal products whose cholesterol levels 135. If we check their high sensitivity C reactive protein and find out what inflammation they have in their cardiovascular system, we're going to see some inflammation. It's going to be higher than mine. Okay. So this is don't, don't get caught chasing false gods, but people in their anxiety are going to do that. So they're going to, they're going to be chasing, you know, uh, nutrients and nutrient concentrations and so on and so forth, rather than looking at first, second, and third in health is going to be is going to be how much crap is in the diet. That's the, that's the issue. After that, we worry about how much poisons, possible nutrient deficiencies, and also by all means, exercise levels, sunshine exposure, all of these things put together are, are the picture of health. But first, second, and third is how much crap are you eating? That's the biggest issue. And that will never be the thing that gets the most airplay. Yeah. Well, I, well, I think these, oh, oh, oh okay. I was just going to say, I think these things can sometimes be um, a, a smoke screen too, for just running into trouble and, and failing. Um, and so people, people, you know, it's very, very difficult to escape the pleasure trap for any amount of time. And as long as there's some sort of uh, threshold at which there's this, you know, there's, there's a list of rules that you need to accomplish to be successful. If, if you've taken that on as your metric, you, you have sort of a built-in excuse for why it is that you haven't met your goals when really it's just incredibly difficult to get out of the pleasure trap. It's incredibly difficult to um, make these changes in your life. But I think there is a tendency in a lot of personalities to, to, um, you know, oh, well, I, I haven't been able to lose 
uh, 50 pounds because I don't get all of my G bonds every day when, which that, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with getting all of your G bonds every day that it's very, you know, it's a great, very, uh, health promoting selection of foods, but that's probably not what's keeping you from meeting your goals, but it can serve that purpose for people who are feeling really competitively cornered with a really difficult problem. Great. Thanks. Well, what was that? That was interesting in that video, Dr. Lau, because I watched it before asking the question is nobody else talks about the fact that our bodies can make these nutrients. It's like, it's almost like that's a missing piece. Nobody seems to know that. that oh, there are bodies can, for example, recycle them. Right. Because that's, that recycle was recycle them, not make all of them. Yeah. People, yeah. people are so afraid. And it seems like right. a lot of the people that are touting these deficiencies have something to sell us, not all, but some, but a lot of people don't realize that our bodies can actually make these nutrients. Well, or not make AJ, or they could, they can recycle, manufacture, et cetera, et cetera, out of other pieces. Yes. So the usually uh, not, not yeah. everything. There are well, things that we, we do need to supplement with, or we need to be careful that we're getting, but, but yeah, the, I think there is sort of a, a feeling that you need to get your RDA every day. <laughs> and yeah. if you don't hit your RDA every day, then you're in big trouble, which is rarely the case. Yes. The, the, the best document that I've, that I've ever read on this, uh, and it's the most definitive argument I've ever seen is whole by Colin Campbell. Mm -hmm. So in whole, uh, Colin uh, goes through the logic and the evidence with respect to uh, uh, many nutrients, showing the fascinating recycling capability of the body when it gets put under a deprivation situation. I can't remember exactly what the nutrients are. I've known about this for a long time because Alan, uh, obviously, when he was an early student of fasting, uh, the big thing that everybody will jump up and down and scream is that if you're fasting, you're going to die of nutrient deficiencies because suddenly the body has nothing. And, and Alan uh, educated me clear back in the 1980s about the fact that the, the evidence was already clear that many of these critical nutrients are being recycled beautifully at, at incredible levels. And it's like, oh, okay, well, that's how this miraculous machine works. And then the, the next time I am able to observe this is 40 years later when I'm reading whole uh, and, and I'm reading whole and I'm seeing exactly the same arguments, the, very, the same type of evidence. And I've forgotten if we flipped open a copy and we would, we would find somewhere Colin showing that some nutrient or, or other gets recycled at the factor of 10,000 to one. So in other words, it, you, you, can, you can literally take one ten thousandth of what it is that you might need and whip it into what it is that you need. So in other words, unbelievably, uh, the, the body is tremendously capable of dealing with deficiencies. Um, you know, obviously, if you put it under an extraordinary deficiency for a long period of time, you're eventually going to get some health compromises. But that is an atypical result, particularly in a land where people get some French fries and they get a pickle on their, on their cheeseburger and they, they get some Coca-Cola in there. I mean, they're getting all kinds of stuff. I mean, that, that's enough to actually spin the average human with a cigarette in its mouth to its 78th birthday, for God's sakes. So the vegans who are eating a very healthy diet uh, with all kinds of variant nutrients in there, the fact that they are worried about something that they're missing you know, this is HCNC, but that's one reason they're here. <laughs> you know what I mean? If they weren't HCNC, they wouldn't be anywhere near us. So it's no surprise that just because they find exactly where it is that they ought to be, that their, that their psychology continues. Of course it would, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's just, just like the, the guys at Facebook are trying to figure out how to get more business. It's like, well, no surprise. Who, who, who do we think got to where they are? So yeah, that's what's going on. But yeah, the, the, it's not madness. It's just the obsessiveness. And it, uh, it, it isn't doing particular harm other than it's taken up a lot of time and energy that we could be doing some other things. But if you're an HCNC, now you're stuck. You, know, you, you found the holy grail of diet and health. This is as good as it gets. And if you're an HCNC, sorry, you're probably going to spin a while such as life. Thank you. Well, I'm going on my 11th year of not eating nuts and seeds, and I'm waiting to see when I develop this deficiency. Very good. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks. So actually one question was sent in and I apologize to Kath. I didn't see it. 
Could you please ask the lovely doctors this question? My stepson recently wrote to my husband sharing that he has felt disconnected from him and the rest of the family since my husband separated from his ex-wife 20 years ago and blaming him for a variety of problems. This came to a huge surprise because my stepson lived with his father and they always seemed to have a close loving relationship apart from the usual challenges of divorce and blended family. There have been no traumas in the family. However, we noticed a growing distance after he got together with his wife about five years ago. She is disagreeable, emotionally unstable, and studying psychology. Reminds me of somebody we both know. <laughs> she has had major dramas with most people in the family, and a number of family members have been thrown out of their village. He also sent some videos to watch of a psychologist take, talking about childhood traumas like divorce and its effect on adult problems. As I listened to him, my bullshit meter was going crazy. How do we dis- respond in a way that doesn't threaten access to our grandchildren? Uh. Finally, we get to the uh, the real the nugget of the question. The real problem, right? Yeah, yeah. my my uh, the the bitch uh, wife uh, daughter in law stepdaughter in law is holding my grandchildren hostage. Right. Uh, what do I do about it? <laughs> That's really how we could have formulated that question, I believe. The. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I don't know. Uh, this sounds like the the, the stepdaughter in law has little borderline tendencies. Uh, so, in other words, it sounds like whatever her own insecurities are, she's essentially building a barricade around her husband so that uh, so that he does not uh, find any possible way of escape. Uh, that is standard sort of borderline ish uh, game game plan. <laughs> burn every bridge there is so that the guy has nowhere to go but stay right at home with you so that's probably what's happening and um, yeah, that that sounds to me like that's probably right does that sound about right to you jen that sounds exactly like what's going on yeah i i borderline or not she's definitely getting very tribalistic and territorial and and uh drawing strong lines in the sand yeah we, we don't know how uh, susceptible she is to a, a circuit flooding strategy to, right. to sort of, there are a lot of different things that you could attempt. We would kind of need to know, this is a very, this would be a good beat your genes question because we would need to know more about the particulars of the situation and how, um, you know, what kinds of conflicts you've negotiated before. My, my first strategy would be kill it with kindness, basically, you know, go, go flood those circuits as we say, and give that daughter-in-law a lot of status, a lot of status about how great she is and how, um, you know, important it is that you, you connect with those kids and you, you just make yourself very low cost. You're nothing but a great asset and a benefit as far as the interactions go. And I would, I would sort of, uh, you know, build that up for a while before attempting anything else, just sort of stoking the goodwill and, and making yourself into, um, somebody who is a, a great flatterer and a, and a great asset to her, um, and see if that softens things up at all. And if that doesn't work, there are some other things that you can try, but often that will work with sort of narcissistic personalities who, who, when you come and tell them how wonderful they are, they're like, well, I'm glad you finally figured it out. <laughs> I am God's gift. In fact. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All I can, all I can say is one of the one, one of the joys of my life is that uh, being, being a couple of decades older than Jen and having found her, it, it's, like, it's like when you find a quarterback that can, that can throw it better than you can, and you're like, I'm going to teach you everything I know, but, but you got some sauce that I don't have. I don't have that kind of patience. That is exactly <laughs> the right thing to do. Exactly. What, what Jen is telling you is exactly how you would draw that up. I couldn't do it. <laughs> it's hard. I, I would, I would struggle. Yeah. <laughs> but this is kind of this case where when it comes to grandkids, yeah. you can suck it up and make it happen. You know, yeah. you can, right. and, and if you can't do it verbally one-to-one, you can send flowery letters. You can send like lots of little digital things. You can, you can kind of pile it on in a way that doesn't like torture your nervous system in the interactions. Yeah. Um, but this is always the first line of defense when you're dealing with this sort of disagreeable territorial person is like, hey, I just think you're amazing. Um, and you don't have to believe it, you just have to sell it. And that this is the narcissist test where 
even if you're not particularly convincing, they they are so desirous of and willing to hear this that they will they will just be like, well, thank you. Okay, yeah, I do deserve this. They they're not gonna their BS meter doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've heard you guys say that whenever there's a problem in a relationship, always look to status. And I do take your advice when I can, but it's really hard for me. But I always think they're going to know I'm insincere. Yeah. Well, yeah. As, as Jen's talking about, this is the narcissist test is that you, you, you feed them extra. Okay. And it's <laughs> kind of like somebody at your dinner table that says that they're not that hungry for dessert, but you suspect otherwise. And you put a big chunk of carrot cake out there. And then when they swallow it down whole and are looking around, you realize, oh, <laughs> it's not quite what we thought. Or but, the person who doesn't fight back twice on the bill. Like, you know, there's sort of, there's a negotiation with them when the bill comes where it's like, no, 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 I'll get it. No, 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 I'll get it. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful. That is absolutely fabulous. Yeah. There should be a little more pushback. <laughs> be, prepared, be prepared that 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 uh, I I of course smell the deep rat as does Jen, mm -hmm. and I, I believe that this is that you are up against a tough bitch. Uh, that if he's writing a letter to his father about how shitty his life is because he got wrecked in the divorce twenty years ago, and yeah. that, that he's sending you a therapist talking about the childhood trauma of the whole thing this you are in trouble and so the grandchildren are hostage they're not even hostages okay the truth is is that that your relationship with that those grandchildren is for probably the present time and all in all likelihood nothing other than collateral damage to the anxiety and insecurity of a borderline-ish female who is, who is cutting off all family communication and support between her spouse and his life okay so that's that, too bad. And unfortunately, you don't get to dictate those terms. Uh, you have to live with what it is that you can get. And your life is gonna have to be plentiful without uh, grandchildren contact to speak of. And that is that. So that is probably where we're going. Probably. But by all means, take Dr. Hawk's uh, advice uh, carefully because it is, the, it is the best advice, even <laughs> though it's not right. <laughs> <laughs> also, I mean, while this is going on, you're you're leaving a strong paper trail of cards at every birthday, every holiday, letters, phone calls, Skype calls, etc. So even if she is patrolling the, the borders very closely until those kids are teenagers, when they are 12, 13, 15, um, if they do desire a relationship with you, they have some foundation and they, they have some memories of you, unless she's truly, you know, she's, she's burning the letters as they come in and the cards are never getting to them, which happens sometimes. But as long as you're maintaining a presence um, as, as much as possible, and you're doing so in this sort of saccharine sweet way, as much as you can manage, um, that is, it's keeping the door as open as probably it's realistic to keep it for the duration of their childhood. Um, and then when they're older, they, they get to negotiate that relationship with you on their own terms. Um, and they'll, they'll have something to base that on. How are these horrible people getting married in the first place? <laughs> They've got talents. <laughs> <laughs> Great. This was so much yeah. fun. Do you want to call it a, a day or do you want to take one question from the chat? Uh, we'll take one from the chat. And we're gonna okay. Well, I'll ask them in the order received and it was from Video Nights 1000. What if the thing you are craving is in your house? Hmm. <laughs> there will be a moment where you have the presence of mind and the strength of will to throw it away. <laughs> and in that moment, you, you just have to throw it away. I'm assuming this is something you kind of bought for yourself as a treat. That's not normally there. If it's, if it's something that someone else who lives in the house brought in, then that's a whole other, you've got to negotiate that whole situation and make sure that that doesn't happen. But if this is something that you got for yourself in case of a rainy day, there will be a moment where you, you are able to throw it away and, you know, put dish soap on it or whatever you have to do to keep yourself out of it. And you just have to seize that moment and, and do it um, and not, not lose the day and get the case of the efforts. Yeah. 
I think I, they didn't say, but I have a feeling it's because it's somebody else's, but that's if, just, yeah. That's if it's somebody else's, then you get into the whole other set of tools in the toolkit, which are, you know, first you, you negotiate and you say, Hey, this is really a problem for me. I'm trying to uh, reach some goals. I'm trying to make some changes and, and this is a real trigger food for me. Would you be willing to, uh, you know, keep it out in the garage or not bring it in the house or do whatever you have to do. If you run into a lot of resistance there, then um, there are other techniques that you can employ, including locking it up, um, you know, sort of do, doing whatever you have to do. What'd you say, Doug? Divorce. Yeah. <laughs> other techniques like that. Sure. <laughs> or you could just throw the other person out that has the crap. <laughs> or you can move out or, you know, there, it, this is kind of, this is, I always file this under the pleasure trap is not a normal problem. And sometimes the solutions are not normal. They require us to do things that are uncomfortable and cause conflicts in our relationships and, and disrupt our status quo. Um, but otherwise that, that substance is going to be in your house. And it's, if, if, if that's what's standing between you and your, in your goals, your health, your health goals, then that's what needs to be addressed. And so it's the same. I mean, I, you know, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I, I can't have a, a full bar in my house. It just is not a good idea. So, um, people need to, kind of draw these lines and figure that out with people that they're living. Um, and every, every relationship is going to have a different set of negotiation. Absolutely. But I think as long as it's there, they are going to, they're not going to be able to stop thinking about it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, so thanks. It's got to go. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Hawk, Dr. Lau. It's always a treat to have you on this 700th episode. May you come back 800, 900, and even maybe a thousand. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. All yeah, right. Take always care. Always good everyone. to be here. All and right, please have a good go weekend. to us. Please go to steamdynamics.com and they have a wonderful membership that's about the price of a cup of coffee and they do monthly Q and A's twice. They had one today. So please check it out. I'll have everything in the show notes. And thanks everyone for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we, we uh, continue with True North Health Week. We have Dr. Sadiq Shiraz and on Sunday, you know who we have guys? Alan. That's right. Oh, the <laughs> The no. hammer himself. Yeah, he's going to run it. And we've got like a hundred questions. He probably can get them done in an hour yeah. knowing him. Probably. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, good luck with that. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs> Take care and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.